When Dr. Carroll begins to speak, he raises a sheet of paper in front of him and reads certain facts from it. The white sheet of paper prominent in the middle of the screen is a distraction for the eyes to lock onto in order to cause the hypnotic state of mind while information is programmed to the audience verbally. Dr. Carroll delivers his lines with a hypnotic rhythm that is punctuated by changes in pacing, volume, and tone, just like a hypnotist. He speaks with authority and looks into the camera and into the eyes of the audience. Both are hypnotic techniques. Picture yourself in a movie theater. Now imagine a huge face on the screen staring at you. The stated intent of reefer madness was to stamp out the menace of marijuana because it leads to, quote, acts of shocking violence ending often in incurable insanity, end quote. In contrast, young people are shown having a good time smoking marijuana, dancing, kissing, and retreating to the bedroom. By showing young people having a good time smoking marijuana, Reefer Madness encouraged young people to at least try it. By telling the story of normal kids going berserk because of marijuana, Reefer Madness scared older people into demanding that something be done. This movie was part of a well-orchestrated propaganda campaign that included newspapers, magazines, and radio. In 1937, about a year after the release of the movie, the Marijuana Tax Act was signed into law, with a major effect being to drive prices up for marijuana to make its cultivation and distribution profitable. Bertrand Russell, philosopher, educator, and atheist, wrote in his book, The Impact of Science on Society, I think the subject which will be of most importance politically is mass psychology. Its importance has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of propaganda. Although this science will be diligently studied, it will be rigidly confined to the governing class. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. There could be no effective propaganda without mass media. Former national editor at the Washington Post and dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California at Berkeley, Ben Bagdikian, reported in his book, The Media Monopoly, published in 1983, that 50 corporations controlled most of America's media. When the second edition of the book was published in 1988, that number shrank to 29. In the third edition, published in 1990, the number shrank further to 26. The consolidation of ownership of the press, publishing, radio, television, and film makes the coordination of propaganda possible. The primary means for controlling people is the absolute control of information. Men in power often withhold information for selfish ends. They often present false information as a diversion for the same reason. Words can inform or misinform. What people think can be controlled by controlling information. Schools are institutions commanding trust, respect, and confidence. Picture a child studying in school, reading a book. The printed words are a distraction for the eyes to lock onto. The mind focuses on the content of the book. The information being read is being programmed to the reader's mind. The child has no reason to believe that a book would intentionally contain information that was false, and so accepts it as true, even if the child does not understand it. This is especially true in school, where there is pressure to accept what is presented as true, because that is expected and compliance determines both your grade marks and future. Repetition of the information constitutes mental programming. Thus, this information is accepted as true without thinking about it whenever it is presented again. The college textbook, Introductory Psychology, 
Second Edition by Jonathan L. Friedman, published by Addison Wesley Publishing Company, contains information that is false. This textbook used for General Psychology Course 221 at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, fall semester 1982, says the following about brainwashing. Some people who talk about brainwashing seem to believe that it involves extremely powerful methods that are almost irresistible. However, there is no evidence to suggest the existence of any such methods. In fact, the attempts at brainwashing we know about were not especially successful. This is contrary to numerous documented reports, both academic and governmental, particularly official findings regarding brainwashing of POWs in Korea. There could be no effective propaganda without education. In the early 1900s, there began a dramatic shift in emphasis in American education from intellectual development to socialization. The goals of education became political and social rather than academic. This was due in large part to John Dewey, who denied the existence of God and moral absolutes. As a result, the concept of right and wrong was removed from the schools, leading to a multitude of problems witnessed today. Professor Dewey based his educational reforms on the experimental psychology developed at Leipzig University by Wilhelm Wundt. Professor Wundt believed that man had no spirit. In his view, man was only a stimulus response animal. This kind of thinking led to the principles of conditioning developed by Ivan Pavlov and behavioral psychologists John Watson and B.F. Skinner. As a result, schools became indoctrination centers designed to bring about a new social order. Education of the young is used to condition them to what comes later, thereby eliminating the difference between propaganda and education. The mind is conditioned with vast amounts of information disguised as facts and knowledge and dispensed for ulterior motives. According to the minute books of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Carnegie Endowment, the Ford Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation worked in harmony for the control of education in America. The key to their plan to bring about social change was to alter the teaching of American history. The Guggenheim Foundation agreed to provide fellowships for doctoral candidates of American history selected by the Carnegie Endowment. Twenty prospective teachers were assembled and taken to London to be briefed on what was expected of them. This group of historians became the nucleus of the American Historical Association. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present? controls the past, wrote George Orwell. Norman Dodd, research director for the Special Committee to Investigate Tax-Exempt Foundations created by the 83rd Congress, was invited in November 1953 to meet in New York with Roman Gaither, president of the Ford Foundation. Mr. Gaither made a most revealing admission. Mr. Dodd, we operate here under directives which emanate from the White House. The substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power to alter life in the United States so that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. 